Sifat Bari. Uh, I've just been accepted to Brown University for graduate studies in physics. I'm here with my family, my mom, my dad, and my little brother to celebrate. So Hi. go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, my name is Bono Isaac Berry. Uh, I'm 12 years old and I'm going in the fall, uh, next month actually, to NYU for a double degree in math and physics for my bachelor's. So let's start by talking about the Greek polymath famously cited as the father of physics, Aristotle. So can you tell me about the time period Aristotle lived in and also what are the theories that he created? Sure, so Aristotle thought that the entire world was created of four basic elements, earth, water, fire, and air. He thought that any element, anything else, any compound could be made out of these simple four elements. That mm -hmm. was number one. Number two was that he thought all objects obeyed a simple dynamical law, F equals mv. That came from his idea that all objects have a natural resting state. If I let a ball roll on a table, it'll come to rest, right? Yeah. Now today we know that's because of friction, but Aristotle didn't have that idea. Instead, he thought that all objects want to naturally relax. They want to come to rest. So if the net force on an object is zero, if I don't exert any force on an object, then its velocity should be zero, right? Of course. And I should keep having to prod the object to make it keep moving. That's why he came up with F equals mv, because if F is zero, then v is zero. But mm -hmm. today we know that that's wrong. The natural state of an object is not to be at rest, but to be in motion. If you don't exert any force on an object, it's just going to keep on moving. In fact, that's Newton's law of inertia. An object in motion stays in motion. Of course. Right? That's why Newton corrected that F equals mv with F equals ma, so that if the net force is zero, not the velocity is zero, now the acceleration is zero. If the acceleration is zero, you can still afford to have a velocity. So that's why Newton's correction to Aristotle was F equals ma. Yeah, but you, we can't just blame ancient physicists uh, by saying, why couldn't Aristotle think about Newtonian physics? Was he just too stupid to do that? Well, no, let's think about it. First of all, Newton built on the work of past scientists like Galileo and Voltaire. Uh, Aristotle didn't have that base of work to begin with. And secondly, I mean, Aristotle didn't have the equipment and designs that Newton had when he was figuring out physics. He was, uh, Aristotle was working with the basics, not even any scientific equipment. There were no such thing as science before him. So the fact that he came up with such rudimentary theories and that they're even close to the formulation of physics that we use nowadays is marvelous. Yes, indeed. So now F equals MA is closely related to Newton's law of gravitation. Can you give us Newton's universal law of gravity? So Newton's universal law of gravitation essentially states that a large massive bodies well Yes. So Talking about FG equals dmm over r squared sounds like gibberish, but essentially what that means is that over time, as two bodies uh, get farther and farther apart, then uh, the force between them, the gravitational force, declines at a very fast rate. So, uh, yeah, the one over r squared. Yes, uh, oh. that's what the one over r squared means. And what's on the top is mostly a bunch of constants, but mm -hmm. essentially it's proportional to the masses of the two bodies. So essentially what that's saying is that it's, uh, it's dependent or proportional. Uh, it grows as the masses of the two bodies grow, and it shrinks as the distance between them grows. That's How did Newton come simple. up with his universal law of gravity? Well, well, an apple hit his head, and then he asked a simple question. If an apple falls, does the moon also fall? Funny, funny, funny. But, but that's true. So in 1665, during the Great Plague, when all of Trinity was closed down, he wrote down simple equations at the age of 21, which is, by the way, my same age, which means I'm going to also have a great theory pretty soon. So at that age of 21, he wrote down, he invented an entire branch of mathematics, calculus, to explain the laws of gravity. And then he came up with all of classical mechanics really? with that simple universal law of gravity. Really? So then why don't I see any... Wait, one second. Okay, that universal law of gravity explains all of planetary motion. In fact, Tycho Brahe's data that he spent years uh, culminating, looking at the stars and looking at how the planets orbit the sun. And then Kepler summarized all of Brahe's data in just three simple laws, Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. And those are based solely all on Newton's laws. could be derived from Newton's laws of classical mechanics. 
Of because course. Kepler couldn't motivate where the laws came from, but he could just say that the laws fit the data. But Newton could show that those laws were a direct consequence of his universal law of gravity. But wait, one second. So, uh, if he used calculus to come up with his theory of physics, why don't I see any derivatives or limits or integrals in GMM over R squared? Oh, because they're all hidden in that A. All of Newton's universal law of gravity is in that second derivative of position. That's why most laws of physics are second derivatives in time. Of course. Or for example, second law is f equals ma. That's second. That's a second derivative in time. Maxwell's equations. A lot of them are second derivatives in space, and some of them also in time. And the wave equation is a second derivative equation in time. The heat equation is a second derivative equation in time, but first derivative in position. So that's the idea. Hmm. Well, okay, so why was Newton's law of gravity incorrect? Why, why, why did it have to be fixed? Well, the thing is... When, when does it fail? Okay, so the thing is, it's slightly inaccurate when you have uh, much larger masses which uh, bend the fabric of our universe, also known as space-time, to a considerable degree, and then you have objects traveling uh, such as light at a very fast speed. So, uh, this can cause distortions in how, uh, for example, light travels. Okay. Light might not travel in the straight line that we think it should, like... Actually, it does. That's called a geodesic. One what second. Happens? Give me one second, okay? okay. Please. All right. Let's say you have an ant crawling on a sphere, right? Okay. And it wants to get from A to B. So this ant is actually a ray of light in our space time. Okay. Uh, if our space time was a sphere, which of course we don't know its actual shape, but that can only tell you if it's than that can only tell you if it's curved or not. And that tells you if the triangle tangles add up to less than 180, then you're on a positively curved surface like a sphere. The right, Mr. Sure. Action Lab, but that's not a very sufficient way of determining the shapes of space-time, and they can even be—they're uh, not even really unique for okay. every possible shape of space-time. Okay. So I think we need a more uh, accurate way to get to the point. And the thing is, if we have an ant crawling to point A to point B, you'll see that it takes a curved path on a great circle. You might think, uh, how is it that dumb? Why doesn't it just crawl in a straight line? And the uh, reason it's because it can't go through space-time, it has to obey the uh, shortest path in, in space-time, and that shortest path is along the great circle. Okay. So that's what the geodesic is, is telling us. Right. Geodesic. And so the geodesic is the shortest path in space-time that a particle can follow, yep. obeying the geometry of space-time. And that is how light travels and why you might see... Right, Yep. Why are you trying to explain relativity to me? Right. So, and why, um, particularly, Rifas, you don't even know what that means. And uh, the Ricci tensor is actually a good the example of development oh is when things get very small. We have what? Can you, like, not interrupt me? But okay. yeah. So when things get uh, very small and uh, go very fast, then we have. Uh, that Einstein field equation, which is a differential equation okay, where we're solving for the metric tensor. So general relativity essentially works uh, when you have very large objects traveling at very fast speeds. Then we have a considerable change to uh, the shape of space-time. Essentially, the well, Einstein Describe field equation, which the is the culminate. Man, didn't we agree for you to not interrupt oh, me? Okay, okay. Just okay. So we have uh, the shape of our space-time which is described by the metric tensor. It's the variable that we're solving for mm. in the field equation. Mm -hmm. And essentially, uh, what we have there is, in the field equation, is we have a bunch of things that tell us about the properties of space-time, like okay. the Ricci tensor. If you have a curve in space-time, like, for example, a wow. triangle, you can, fi you can figure out what the tangent vector to that curve is, or in the case of our space time, okay. uh, the tangent space. Mm -hmm. And then from that, uh, you can deduce exactly how curved your space time is. So uh, that's like um, a more advanced version of the rudimentary analogy drawing a triangle in your space time. So that's the Ricci tensor, which is dependent on the geodesic, which is itself a function of uh, the which is itself a function of the metric tensor, 
which makes this uh, differential equation of the sorts. Tensor. Yeah, I said that. And then you, uh, this is all equivalent to a proportional constant mm -hmm. times the stress energy tensor, which is essentially, which is essentially how the distribution of mass all around our universe. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, that's the uh, Einstein field equations explained. So special relativity is what happens when objects move close to the speed of light. So let's say you have two observers. It's good to define two postulates that form the entire basis of special relativity. Do you remember what those two postulates are? So the first there's one a postulate that states... Go, please. That's right. Okay. So there's a postulate that states that in every inertial reference frame, okay. the laws of physics are the exact same. That's correct. So, and, and the, uh, the second postulate is that nothing can travel faster than light. That's okay. incorrect. The oh, second really? postulate is that the, oh, speed, the speed of, of light, light is the, same, is in the same in all reference frames. So, for example, if I fire a flash beam, a flashlight, and you have an observer at rest, that beam of light will be moving at 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second with respect to that rest observer. But if I move on a car and I fire that same flashlight, the speed of light will still look the same to me, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So that's the idea behind the two postulates of special relativity. The theory of general relativity breaks down at two places in space and time, at the singularity of a black hole and at the singularity of the beginning of the universe. But we don't have the a theory Bang. for that. So who now, as a matter of fact, we do. For black holes, we have what's known as the Schwarzschild metric. Black holes can be described by just three parameters. You know what they are? Mass, spin, and charge. In reality, most black holes don't even have a charge because they're quickly neutralized. So most black holes are just described by mass and spin. So that means where does Einstein's theory break down? Where the gravitational density at the singularity of a black hole approaches infinity. Okay, you might know that a black hole has a short child radius. If you trespass that short child radius, and cross into the event horizon, then there's no going back. The black hole will suck you up and you into the singularity. The singularity is kind of a uh, one-way highway. If you cross the event horizon, you're going to the singularity no matter what. If you have an infinite amount of energy, maybe a rocket that has a lot of fuel, you still can't escape the event horizon. It's like you can't avoid tomorrow, right? Tomorrow is going to come no matter what because you move one second forward in time every second right well you can just sleep through tomorrow right but you'll still be in tomorrow so that's the idea of the singularity that's where einstein's equations break down so do you have any questions about that breakdown that failure no, no. then let's talk a little um, bit more about black holes so black holes we have uh wait, one second so uh firstly about that ant analogy we talked about earlier is a wormhole like the ant breaking through the space time a so black like, hole a connected wormhole. by a white hole forms a little tunnel in between where the singularity would have been okay, that but tunnel white hole? is exponentially small a white hole is the opposite of a black hole and it's also a prediction of einstein's theory of general relativity instead of spewing stuff in just like a black hole does a white hole is like a giant spewer outer. It pushes stuff out. It just can't hold matter and energy. It so spews it out. So it wouldn't actually so, look that much like a white hole, right? Because the not, reason it why it's called a light. white hole is because it spits out so much matter and energy that that causes a huge release of radiation, really? and it looks like it's kind of throwing up in space. But how do That's we, what a white hole is. But we've and never actually gotten connect, a picture. Have we? Well, we just only recently got a picture of a black hole, which were predicted in 1915 by Einstein's general relativity. It's so, been six years, not very recent, but... No. The and first picture what... of a black hole was taken only in, in 2018 or 2019. That, it's been six years. It's very... It took how many years? It took one century between prediction and experimental observation. Well, when did we predict white holes? I'm Open not sure, years, but right? a leading theoretical physicist, Carlo Rovelli, is looking into white holes as a source of wormholes, which is what happens when you connect a black hole and a white hole. So if you connect a black hole and a white hole, there's an infinites, not infinitesimally small, a exponentially small tunnel where the singularity would have been. But what does but, it mean to connect a black hole and a white hole? So what it means is that instead of having a singularity at the end of the black hole, you have a little tunnel where you can go into the black hole, cross the tunnel, go through the neck of the 
oh. wormhole bottle and then emerge out of the white hole into another part right. of the universe. So like, let's say I have this ball of Play-Doh representing space-time, and mm -hmm. I roll it into a little cylinder, like a little box, you know, representing black hole gravitational anomaly. That's and right. then we have like, the same box mech, but upside down, to okay. represent the white hole spewing everything out. Okay. So it's like an anti, uh, it's like a convex okay. spell point in space-time. So right. then, if I connect these two, then we get this little hole through which anything can travel, right? That's right. Now, the thing is you need a lot of energy to keep that tunnel open because it disappears very fast. How do so, we know that? Well, that's what the equations predict, that you need an almost exponential amount of energy to keep that tunnel open. 